Welcome, BBCers, to episode number 217 of the Broken by Concept podcast, the number one solo queue educational and motivational podcast. Curtis, today we're going to be exploring three recent Reddit posts from the community over the last couple of weeks. We're going to be talking about the three rank splits. Is it too much? The next post was, why are high ELO players not afraid to die? And then the third one here is, it finally clicked, ELO hell is not real. So Curtis, let's dive into a, uh, this is on the main League of Legends subreddit, 3.3 thousand upvotes, a lot of conversation about this one. This was the big change that Riot did. We talked about it last year, the adding the three rank splits. So let's read this post here. Uh, simply, League of Legends games are very long. The process of queuing up, champ select, and finishing a game takes around 35 to 40 minutes on average. This combined with the fact that you only have the influence of one person on a five-person team makes the rank process very high variance. Don't know if I fully agree with that part there. You can be decently better than your rank and still only win, okay, about 55 to 60% of games. Not to mention unlucky losing streaks that happen to everyone. I'm not claiming that climbing is impossible because of noob team or anything like that, but it's statistically a fact that it may take a large amount of games to reach an accurate rank for your skill level. I miss having the entire year or even half the year to play ranked before the split ended. The current three split system feels really bad for those of us with jobs, busy lives, other hobbies. Four months feels way too short to make meaningful ranked progress, especially since you get reset an entire tier with each new split. It feels like I'm spending 90% of the split crawling through like low diamond. And once I get back to my previous rank, I'm so mentally exhausted. I don't even want to play the last two weeks I have remaining. <laughs> Now, a writer did step into this Reddit thread and actually said, uh, this is from Barack Obama, uh, says, we're actively discussing this right now. In fact, just came from a meeting about the topic. Trust me, we hear you. No promises, yada, 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 but we are discussing changes to the current reset structure we have. You'll hear more when we come to firmer conclusions. Stay tuned. And a funny comment here says, we hear you guys, four splits, here it is. <laughs> So, uh, initially, when we talked about this post, Curtis, we thought it was a pretty good idea. Mm. And I guess, the th and Brian thought it was a good idea as well. What they said was, it's going to give people more incentive to play all the time and not have that weird off-season break that I think they were uncomfortable with that whole two, three months uh, off at the end of the year where ranked shut down and it was like the preseason changes and stuff, which, you know, is a challenge in itself. Now, we've sort of, you know, gone through this, uh, this thread came out. A lot of people, the community seems to agree here. And the way that obviously the three splits work is that uh, four months at a time. So it goes, you know, I can't remember exactly if it's like the like Jan till April and then, you know, four months yep. at a time, right? Uh, now I'm going to start, Curtis, with some sort of observation. You know, the first thing that came to thought when I read this post was just thinking about uh, the most hardcore players, which you would say people that in our programs probably fit that category. They're paying for coaching, right? Um, and I and even my students that have done massive clients from gold to master, all that, they frequently have, I don't want to get your experience on this, periods where they will just not play league for like four or five months and then, you know, come back and have their, their, their spurt. So I thought if that's the case for some of these people that I've observed in my programs, what, you know, what's that like for the majority of the player base? Like, I think that that, Right, probably have the stats on this, right? So maybe it was a stats-based decision. I'm just saying just from my observations. I don't actually think that the majority of league players are playing and playing serious ranked every single month, month to month, month, and then going for those rank rewards. Like maybe it will be uh, a burst of like, okay, I'm going to go for those rank rewards, split one, split two, I'm not really going to try that hard, and then split three. What do you think? Mm. What have you observed mm. there? So, yeah, I, I would say it's quite common for people to go on extended breaks. I don't know if that was is purely intentional or because, like, you know, work or life circumstances. Life circumstances. I'm not 100% sure. I haven't yeah. done enough inquiring over that, so I can't specifically say what's going on there. But I will say it's very rare that someone just consistently plays throughout the entirety of the year. I don't think that's really that common. Even your hardcore students, like people that hit master tier, grandmaster... I don't think I have enough data to say Diamond. that. I know I know from 
from the the hardcore hardcore players they play a lot all the time yeah they play all the time but again i think they are probably the outliers um but i would say you know you know i would say even us nathan right even when we were climbing you know trying to climb we would go through periods where we would play pretty hardcore and and you would try to make a real push for it and you would have moments where it's like maybe a month or two you're like Maybe you're focusing on other areas and you're not really trying to push. Learn new champs, sort of maybe in maintenance mode a yeah, little bit. Yeah, maintenance mode a little bit, you know. And so I think you're still playing the game. You're still playing the game, though. That is true. We were always still playing the game. I was all about players that just won't be right. playing ranks. Yeah. So I, I would tend to agree. I think the the majority of the player base is, the, you know, highly likely taking br- breaks here and there. I, I don't know what that break looks like. Whether it's like. Uh, three months on, one one month off, or it's six months on and then two months off. I have no idea. I can't really comment on that, but I think that's definitely happening in some way, shape, or form. And if you take one or two months off, you're not going to make any progress in that split, right? Realistically, like some of the, the comments say, by the time it takes you to get back to your main rank, you, you know, you're, then you're going to be plateauing. Then the split's going to end, right? Realistically, you're not going to be able to make a, a lot of progress if you're taking any breaks, any significant break in that kind of four month period right would you would you tend to agree with that yeah well right remember they did talk about what they wanted to do was to push to create the system where it's really soft reset like you're basically going to be close to your it's going to take only maybe 20 30 games to get back to your your current rank now i don't really know how true yeah, that is. Yeah, I can't comment on that. Is, uh, cause again, and I, want the, I, I want the comments to let us know. Yeah. In your experiences in, in the community, what do you guys feel? Do you feel that it was easy to get back to the rank that you were at or not? And, but, but this is where it gets challenging, Nathan, right? Even if, right? Even if that was the, to be the case, right? Let's say there was a soft reset and it should only take 20 games to get back to your rank. We know that there is a lot more factors at play, right? Because think about it. What, what typically coincides with a, a split reset? Changes. Changes. Yeah. Meta. Meta. Um, and then also on top of that, Nathan, you know, the psychological effect of climbing and seeing rank changes is so goddamn real. It's really taxing right? people, players. Yeah. So l- the way I kind of mentally view it, right? It, it, let's say someone hypothetically finished at Emerald 4. Okay. So they finished, the, they finished the split one at Emerald 4. Split two rolls around. New meta comes out. Maybe some changes with with some patches, whatever. And let's say the end of their placements, they, I don't know how it works, but let's say platinum three, right? I'm just going to throw it out there. Let's say platinum three. Let's say they win a few games, they get to platinum two, and then they have a few unlucky games. Let's say they lose three in a row, or maybe they lose six in a row. That can happen. You have two pretty rough blocks. The significance in terms of like, I guess how much we we emphasize those particular losses will be v- very very painful, because think about it. In their mind, two weeks ago I was Emerald Four. I've now lost six games in Platinum Two. You know what I mean? Like it's not like oh yep yep I get it. My I'm I'm gonna get back to Emerald Four really quickly. Like we're not logical no. when it comes to ranked. Yeah. It's v- most people are incredibly emotional yeah. when it comes to ranked. They're and not th- these changes again. They sound they're really good theoretically. Theoretically. But, but logically, like I could see like right having the meeting and like all, all their thought process, even even in our episode, yeah. we said, yeah, that yeah. makes sense. We're all good, but you saw really no flaws in it. It's the psychological yeah. kind of aspect I think that Ryder are potentially missing here. Mm. People don't people don't have rank the rank system is an inherently incredibly emotional experience. Yes. Right? It, it's the it's the it's the um What's the word? Like the novelty of getting a particular rank or like the prestige of getting a rank. It's, it's, these are all very emotional, egotistical kind of things. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But right need to factor that in. Sometimes the feeling of, of losing your rank after you earn, you, you blood, sweat and tears, you get to Emerald 4, boom, it's gone. That That is, you know, whether you like it or not, whether right agree with that or not, that is, it, there's an impact there, a psychological toll that I think it takes on the on the player base and having to get back to the rank, even if, even if it should theoretically only take 20 games, the, the psychological toll of those losses in Platinum 2 for that, you know, hypothetical player, um, it's going to take a toll. Yeah. Um, Versus just maybe being Emerald 4, Plat 2. Do, the reset doesn't happen. They, you know, they're still bouncing and they can sort of see their progression more clearly. Hmm. You're sort of saying, yeah. Exactly right. 
So I saw another comment here, people saying that the rewards as well are not that exciting. Like apparently the ride have done a bit, a bit low effort. I don't even, I don't really look at rewards. I don't even know what the rewards were for each mm. split. Uh, and maybe the, you know, the should, it should be more so like a big, really cool reward. Their ride puts a lot of effort in rather than like an okay or good, pretty cool reward for the three splits, right? Yeah, look, I'm just spitballing off the top of my head, right? Maybe there's a model whereby there's only maybe, let's say, one giant rank finish, right? So, so like, it's one reset it, each year. I'm just, I'm just going to, let's say this is an option. I'm not yeah. saying they should do this. Let's say it's an option, right? Yeah. You have one giant, it's one giant season. And therefore, the prestige of finishing a particular rank at the end of the season would be a big deal, right? It's your goal for, or plat, whatever for that year. But maybe there is a thing where it's like, you remember back in the day where... Uh, there was the challenger icons where there was challenger top 10, challenger top 50 and challenger top 200 or whatever it was, right? So they all got challenger, but the flair of the icon was different, right? The icon in, of top 200 was slightly different to the top 50 and the top 10 was slightly different to the top top 50, right? Top 10. Most, most people don't even know that exists, right? Only the elite of the elite only even knew that was, was a thing, right? Most people who put that challenger icon wouldn't even be able to tell the difference between the top 200 and the top 10. We could, I mean, I could, I, I was in the small over it. little community, in that small little community. Yeah. But my point that I'm trying yeah. to get at is maybe that there are accessories, kind of accessory prizes or accessory things that you could add on to encourage people to play the game. So it says, if you got your rank and you 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 showed that you played a consistent amount of games over the entire year, or you know you played X amount of games over that season, you get um, this extra. Okay, so it's not, it's, it's not a rank reset. No, it's you, additional it's prizes, prizes or yeah. additional kind of incentives for playing consistently throughout a year or maintaining, maintaining that rank. rank. Yeah, maybe if you drop down, you you lose or well, having a peak maybe somewhere. You know, you you peaked at this for a certain period of time. I think you could get really creative with incentives. People obsess over chromas and skins mm. and, and 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 like like. Um, you know, uh, profile flares. Like there's so many things you could do or even the, the, the border itself, right? Let's say you might have one Emerald player has like a normal Emerald border. And let's say someone who played Emerald throughout the entirety of the year showed that he played a thousand games in Emerald and and ticked all these things. They might have like a, a glowing Emerald one. And they're both Emerald. They both get Emerald, but one has like a fancier border. And people love that shit. And so that way you, you, you serve two audiences. You serve the hardcore audience that will be rewarded for their effort and their time in the game. But then you also kind of serve the people that maybe aren't willing to put in, you know, 2000 games a season um, and, and just want to kind of get that rank. You know what I mean? Like you could kind of, I'm sure there's a better way to do it in hindsight, reflecting on the community's response rather than three rank splits. Hmm. What do you think about that, Nathan? Yeah, I mean, I like it. I think that makes sense rather than the reset trickle in rewards somehow get creative with that i'm sort of tossing between here now what's the difference between two splits mm. you know the year is quite long no pre-season just no let's get, screw pre-season screw the, the the that like weird lull state right between the the seasons you just have no boom November, six December. months boom six, six months. months and it's like the equivalent of like msi worlds i think that would make sense as well mm. Six that, months is a good is a good duration, I think. That would have to, yeah, they'd have to play around with the time period because you wouldn't want the split ending when November and December, where the whole game changes, right? So they'd have to experiment with that. But yeah, yeah. two splits or one split, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. We're not, I don't know. We're not game. I mean, I'm yeah. sure there's many people that that there's know obviously about challenges it. with the one finish and you know win trading and that becomes such an important time of the mm. year that there's so much effort energy put into that that can be but they sort of just have to solve that problem i think look realistically nathan and Sol that's more so for high elo well solo queue is always chaotic towards the end of the split all the time no matter what i mean i, I see this and, now and the reality is remember is that that's you doing your homework the night before you know studying right so like you know if you're in that situation where win traders are going to be affecting your end of season rank well then you probably didn't put the work in for the last couple it's of months. It's very rare that I even see someone get the result that they were looking for in the last like week of it. Yeah, that's it's, right. Like, sometimes you do. You get outliers. But I would say most people, don't. if they leave it too late to that last week, you're not going to get the rank. That's just mm. the reality of the mm. situation. Um, But yeah, no, I think that, that this is a really important thing to address. And 
I, my my intuition and and just feeling it and just the community's response, it's not it's not right, right as it currently no. is. There's no, it, I don't think that's the the play, the three splits. Yeah, so, I think, so we'll see what I do. I guess. Yeah, we'll see what they do. I think that just the one end, it, it's it's easier to sort of package that up as well in terms of marketing, and it's like you know, play ranked, finish your the year. This was my rank for this year. I think it is a lot cleaner that cleaner way. Cleaner well. that way. Versus, you know, OPG. Split one, split two. You know ugly. that it was a bit weird when OPG introduced that? Good. It's like split one, split two, and then they'll split one, split two, split three. Yeah, I really don't like it. You mentioned something interesting, Nathan, about um, about some of the people in the uh, esports, about the finals. You want to... Oh, yeah. L- L- the bit? LEC. Uh, some feedback and stuff from the LEC. They did the whole three split system. And... I mean, it's sort of a combination where people were not too hot on the the gameplay of, of EU sort of has been the conversation, but it sort of just lost value of like the finals uh, because there's just three So there's finals. three finals. Yeah, yeah. And, and the format was a bit of a mess as well. So yeah, I think that just too, it's just a funny the way how the reward system works in our brains and you know, like you lose value when there's just too much mm. and things just are more exciting. It's like the AFL grand final. It's like the NFL Super Bowl, right? Just that one time a year. But I don't, I'll be honest. Like I'm going to speak from a very casual AFL viewer. So I don't, so for those of you who are not from Australia, our, our, our no, national, you can compare it to Super Bowl, right? Right. Or Super Bowl, right? But I can't speak for that. I don't follow for Super Bowl, but I'm as, me as somebody who watches footy, right? Grew up AFL. Well, yeah. even now, like I actually, so I watch, I like watching finals, Footy. Footy, footy, yeah. Australian football, yeah. League, right? So yeah. I'll chuck on TV and I'll watch the finals. The September season. finals, wouldn't it? Yeah. I like that. I watch the quarterfinal, like the the top, the top eight, whatever it is. I like watching that. I, and I don't, follow, I don't follow footy for the whole oh, year. Yeah, yeah. But I will tune in and I'll watch the finals. Now, I'm not a hardcore... I, I, know, I You know, I'm not a hardcore footy fan by You're, any means. I'm a casual... casual. casual. Right? I barely know Jack shit, right? I know a few players, yeah, that's about it. Yeah. But, you know... It's interesting because think about it. Just because the finals are a one big deal thing, I will tune in and I'll watch a bunch of games. You know, now look, I, I'm assuming uh, AFL would be a lot happier if I tuned into every week and would attend, buy merch, and do all that stuff. Realistically, I'm probably not their most valuable customer, right? And, and viewer. But at the same time, I think there is something to be said about making a massive deal about the end of the year, this giant thing. Now, look, they, I guess, you know. You know, you could argue that they, they are doing that with Worlds and they have done that with the big events like the MSI Worlds. And I, I do like that. But, you know, it's it's interesting to see how how would that, again, play out in in, in the sense of league. Yeah. You well, know, they need it for the, the, the general player base. The general player base. I am the equivalent event. of the general player base yeah. for the AFL viewers is yeah. what I'm trying to get at. So it's different because I'm a viewer versus a player. It's, it's interesting, though. I find that interesting. Yeah. Um, now talking through it now, yeah, I think that I think it's a I hope I hope they just go back to the keep it simple. I don't think they will go back to one year. Really, I don't. I don't think they will. Yeah. I think if they're going to do this, they're not going to go from zero to hundred, right? They're going to go from three to two, and then back to one, and maybe. maybe but they, but, they, but they've tried them all though. Remember, I guess they have tried them all. Surely they have now data. Yeah. on that. Yeah, because you you'd just be able to look at the viewership data. Surely, I mean the play player base data, right? Mm. Um, yeah. The question is, has three splits? helped with engagement and even if that was the case the actual enjoyment the enjoyment right how do you measure that Um, yeah satisfaction player satisfaction i'm assuming there's a way to to measure that i'm sure it'd be metrics right player satisfaction would probably come out in kpis such as like um uh, how often they requeue after a loss you know or do they do they only play for spurts like like continuous playing right like they would look at things like that it's like Mm. do they just play for a spurt lose a few games log off and come by next week or are they consistently playing throughout the week like if you feel fulfilled playing you're i'm assuming you're going to be buying more game uh playing more games and potentially buying more skins as well right i'm assuming there's a correlation between enjoyment of the game satisfaction and, and and actual purchasing power or you know the amount of um skins you buy yeah content but you buy yeah. yeah. A comment here that got 200 upvotes was saying, I used to like one season per year, which would be roughly six to seven months long. And then there's the post preseason where changes are being rolled out and where you can work on your MMR, mm. but it's all a little bit less serious since it didn't determine your end of season rank rewards. Someone said here, the three splits devalues the whole rank ladder. Quality of games is worse than ever. Well, I'm the quality sure game thing, by the way, that's just recency bias yeah. because the end of the split is always bad no matter what. Mm. Someone here says two was fine, split into six months. Uh, Faddish climbed with the LP changes they had. 
especially since a lot of other games don't do year long seasons, but three, every time I go on a loss streak, it feels like I'm insanely behind and won't be able to climb back at all. It's too damn short. Hmm. It's interesting. I do like though the the whole thing though about you know f- the feeling of it rather than the, the the necessary logic behind it. Yeah. Moving on. All right. Next post here. This one was from now Summoner School. Title of this one was "Why Are High Elo Players Not Afraid to Die?" I see a lot of high elo players having a good amount of deaths even when ahead and winning. While I try to keep my deaths, while I try to keep my deaths as low as possible, I'm starting to think my playstyle is wrong, but I have no clue how to change it effectively without trolling. I try to keep my deaths low, not because I want to have a good KDA, but because I think that each time I die, I'm giving free 300 gold to the enemy, and there are good deaths and bad deaths. How should I change my playstyle? So we've done our episode on deaths. Uh, is one of the 200s. I'll have that pop up on the screen. Uh, good deaths, bad deaths. Yep, they absolutely exist. This is sort of the way that I put it, Curtis. The lower rank you are, the easier it is to kill people, and the easier you're easy to die. Like you're easy to kill. So the lower elo you are, yeah, the lower ranks, yeah, the people easy- are easier to kill. Yes. Yeah, people are easy to yes. kill, including yourself. You're e- you're e- very easy to kill. Like if, yep. I, if if we were to jump into to a a you know a, a gold game tomorrow, like we can just get kills because we can read waves and we can understand who's vulnerable. We you know we have but but, it, but even objectively, even if we're not in that, we're just watching a, a gold player. Yeah, play, that's right. exactly right. Yeah, just objectively based off the lack of understanding of particular elements of the game, the, the games are more volatile. People are tend tend to be put they put themselves into more volatile positions. They're more vulnerable. Because of things like wave management, overstaying, staying on low, yeah, staying on low yep. resources, um, not syncing up with their team, making plays on weak side, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the games typically, objectively, whether you're in that rank or not, people tend to die a lot more. Yes. And their deaths are or really the, the low easier value. To kill. Easier to kill. Yes. Like you could look at the deaths so probably could look the same in games. Well, we've got to be careful about this as well, Nathan, because again, it's, it's easier to kill for who? Because, because you've got to remember, it's all relative. This is where this is where it's a very slippery slope. Because we sit here, right, as as high level players, saying they're easier to kill. But if you don't have those skills, they're not easier to kill, right? Like a jungler, if we're talking in, in silver, let's say there's all these laners, right? The top laners overextending and 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 let's say um, uh, overstaying on low resources. You got the mid laner doing make, making fundamental mistakes with wave management. You got bot lane heavy trading, blah blah blah. Greeting blah, blah, blah. for plates. Greeting for plates, whatever. You're assuming that the jungler in silver even understands what's really happening such that they would be able to capitalize on those errors. You know what I mean? So there's, it's in order for a death or a, a, a death to occur, there's two parts of the equation. You have, there's a mistake being made and then there is the capitalization on that mistake by the, by the party, right? By the jungler. So we've got to be careful when saying that they're easy to kill because it's easy to kill, f- you know, in what, for who? You know, that jungler may not have the camera panning ability to even read those plays. They may not even have the understanding of what overstaying is. They may not understand how... Yeah, of course. You see what I mean? Yeah, I see what you mean. It's the same rank, but I'm talking just high level objectively. Yeah, 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 I get you. I just want to be very careful and tiptoe around okay, that. In the way we word that, yeah. like, I think we've got to be... Yeah, we're careful. not just saying, like, oh, you know, your goal, you're missing all these kills, no. you know? Like, yeah, it's obviously hard to identify the skills that... Yes, the skills... But, yes, the, 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 it's... There are more opportunities if you develop these specific skills. Yeah. Is what you're saying. Yeah. And there's lots of like really bad deaths. Yes. Right? Okay. Yep. I'll and the higher that. rank that you go, there's more purpose to fights and there's yes. more structure. More right? intention. More intention. So and the other thing as well that this doesn't really get talked much about because people just disrespect the game and think that every champ has four abilities and everyone just uses their abilities correctly. Higher ranked players just flat out do way more damage than lower ranked players. They're way more effective with their champion. So when they are fighting and when they are like they're dying, they're doing so much damage. Like I have, for example, a Diana game. I think my score was three, five, 17. Uh, and if not a sexy score at all, but if you actually look at my gameplay, I had 80% kill participation. All my fights absolutely hard carried. High assist, but my engages my ults. I was doing so much damage that my team was able to clean up, right? So these were all like really, really good deaths, right? So I'm just doing more damage than a, than a gold Diana player. And I'm fighting purposely. Like I didn't go for that fight. I didn't die when there's no objective up. Or as a jungler, the biggest one is 
dying with all your camps up. That's like the most common mistake you'll see in a silver gold player. They just oversound the map and all that sort of stuff. So that's sort of the way that, you know, to answer this question, why are high yield players not afraid to die? Because they're fighting over, uh, they have purpose and intention for their fights. Now people might be saying, oh, I can see random fights and challenger games get chaotic. That does happen, but rarely or way less frequently than lower ranked games. And just people just do more damage in general. Okay. So so how does that tie in with this specific um, conversation or this this topic? Uh, because when they're fighting, yeah, again, why are high yellow players not afraid to die? When they're fighting, there's they they can they when they take in fights, they know the trade off. Like it's like okay, I'm gonna die, trade a flash here, they and then I can maybe punish this later. Right. On. So you're saying they're looking at the bigger picture. So they know okay, I, I might die here. But if I die here... It doesn't really matter. It's, it's not actually good for me. Or it, or it might be good or it might help someone or else. Or it might just be team. even, you know? Yeah, right. So so, so basically, you know, you're trying to... Basically, the way you're, what you're saying is one of the one of the reasons high, higher ELO players tend to not be afraid to die is because they understand that it's not just about staying alive in league. It's about output. It's about impact. And sometimes to have an impact in the game, you do need to put yourself in vulnerable positions and, and, and assess the trade-off. It's like, okay, if they are here and I do die, I know that I'm going to go down swinging and create a lot, buy a lot of time or do a lot of damage or there is some positive outcome on the back end is what you're saying. Exactly right. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's a huge, a huge part of it. A I, really simple one where a narrative that I have with my coach in my junglers is that uh, for dives, you know, sometimes there are opportunities where there's a three big, three wave stack. And then I say, come on, like you just die for this. It's worth and it's hard for people to wrap their head around because that narrative is mm. is dying is bad. But again, lower rank players they don't understand the trade off of deaths and the the they don't weigh the positives and negatives. Like again, the way that he uh, framed it, each time I die, I'm just giving 300 gold to the enemy. Okay, so the, I want to I want to tackle this at a bit of a l different angle here. I'm going to kind of go a bit left of center. I want to target the word afraid for a second here. Okay. I, I, uh, that word, it's a very loaded term. Afraid. Why are high players not afraid to die? Yeah, I wouldn't use that it's word. It's an interesting word, yeah, isn't it? Now that, now that you think yeah. about it. Like, the, like I don't, I'm not afraid to ever die. I, that, I can be, I'm playing the game. I'm playing the game, but I can, be, I can be situationally scared because I'm under a lot of threat. Like, I, I use the word, like... I, I, I do sometimes use that word, but I, I use it in a different way. Mm. And this is where I want to get aligned with people because... One of my, one of the, my, I guess one of my hobbies within the coaching the, in League of Legends, what I love is analyzing language, language yeah. because there's so many mm. loaded terms in League of Legends. Like we've, we've broken down some of them here on the podcast, like mechanics, like what is, this is an incredibly loaded term or, um, uh, you know, trolls. It's just like, what, what is a troll? Right? We've had these conversations, but I think the word afraid. So in the context where I use afraid, I'll say, I'm, a, I'm, I'm really scared right now. And when I say that, I'll say things like, I'm really scared right now because I've got no vision. I'm versing a heavy dive threat composition. I've got no flash. I'm in a mobile champion. I'm hyper aware of the amount of threat on me in this particular instance. I don't go into the game shitting my pants because I'm afraid to Just die. in general. In general. You might be super confident for the first 15 minutes. And right. at that specific moment now, you're there in might the be, There might be a 15 second window yeah. or a 30 second window where I'm shitting myself. Yeah. But that's like a, a very it's specific to that instance. Yeah. And then I, uh, for example, shutdowns, I'll value my life. Like yeah. certain games, like, you know, if I'm playing, you know, especially if I'm playing early game junglers, like I'm playing Rek'Sai, Java and stuff, I play out of my mind. Somehow I'm just getting a lot of kills. I'm aware of my, like, I'm going to be really, I wouldn't use the word yeah, afraid it's anymore. Afraid. It's disciplined gameplay. I'm going to be really on point. Conservative, yeah. Conservative or disciplined or, yeah, whatever you want to use. But I think in, in, in terms of this, I think the way people see it is that if you if someone is going in and putting themselves in a volatile position where there's not much room for error, they 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 misconstrue that as not afraid to, not afraid to die. And so what I've noticed, and this is something we take for granted, is that whenever we look at we speak about the game and we 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 talk about the game, or even when we review games. We're always looking at it through the particular instance that we are being shown. And so one of the most toxic thing, or I guess rabbit hole, toxic 
rabbit holes you can fall down is that of generalizations. League is a game of specifics. The more general you are, the more susceptible you are to toxic narratives and toxic beliefs. And so where this comes from, when I see these 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 posts are, that they, they, they're trying to extrapolate giant general ideas from observations they're making. And although there might be a, a vague trend, you always got to look at it on a case-by-case basis. And so um, I had a client this morning, right? He is in Diamond. And, uh, and, and and basically, it went along the lines of, they were saying like, okay, I'll get, this is the specific. He said, I feel like I need to hold my TP. Um, and, 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 and I was like, why? And I was looking through the gameplay. And the reason he was holding his TP is because he felt as though he might need it for some future event. And I said, well, why? And you get yeah, into it. Specific. What's the event? What's you're the event? For? And, yeah. and the reason why he was doing that is because his game plans were always very general. His fundamentals were always really incons- inconsistent. So we had this like general like approach to using TP because his gameplay was generalized. It wasn't specific. The more specific you get in league, the more like problems get solved. Like even problems that you weren't even intending to solve get solved. Like for example the more clear you are on your wave management and your matchup hypotheses, and the more you understand about the game, the more your stage four issues get reduced. Because the number one cause of tilt and frustration and anger in solo queue is, an, is, um, is not knowing what's happening and why. Confusion. Confusion. Yeah. If you understand, oh, I, so, so in this game, right, his wave was in a terrible position. His jungler then compensated for him to try and bail him out of a bad situation, same as his support. He then baited his jungle and support in to go for this play. His wave was in a terrible position. Jungle support die. And then now from his perspective, if you don't understand what you just did, if you did, if you just thought that that's your jungler's just bad and your support's just bad, of course you're going to be tilted. I would be fucking tilted, right? If, if, if I didn't know what happened there. But if you know that you're, you baited your team in and you had a bad wave state and you created this scenario... Well, you're not really going to get tilted, are you? It's like, oh, well, I just made a mistake and there's a problem and there's a solution. And so tying this back to this, I think that I don't really think high players aren't afraid. I don't think that's the right way to view it. There is no such thing as being afraid or unafraid. It's just you either feel threatened in a particular scenario or you don't feel threatened. And if you don't feel threatened, there's particular maybe a potentially a reason for that. Whether or not that high elo player logically can break that down, that's a whole different conversation. You'll be some players like Agurin or let's say um, very kind of logical and articulate players may be able to articulate exactly why they did what they did. And there may be other players that may not understand their intuition and they haven't taken the time to break it down. They may make decisions that don't in your mind make sense, but in their mind do. And if actual questioned and and, and prompted, they will be able to break it down for you. It's like, oh, I, I was happy to die here because I would deny that wave or I would buy enough time for my team to do that. Or I know that if I die, I could waste a lot of time and my team could do that. There's always, there'd be some sort of reasoning in some way, shape or form behind it for the most part, for the most part. Yes. So um, loaded terms. You got to look yeah. out for them. We got to break them down. And, you know, as you said, he's trying to, that last little bit of the sentence here is how should I change my play style? That's just like play style is just another Yeah, word. another buzzword. Yeah. It's another general, like what does that even mean? How should I change my play style? What he really means is, is there any big, is there any big 20, is there, is there any big, I guess, cookie cutter formula that I can plug and play into my next game that's going to increase my, my chances of winning? That's really what he's looking for. He's looking for something that doesn't exist. And so the answer to this question is that, yes, there are good deaths and bad deaths, but should you change your play style? Well, no, Um, whatever that means. Let's just say we need to get specific about, we need to look at your gameplay, really. We need to get specific about what's going wrong. Um, We need to look at your deaths. We need to look at your laning. We need to look at your decisions. That's it. I can't really give any advice. It's It's a general question. Remember, general questions... I responded with general answers. And that's what we, that's, that should be one of our mantras, Nathan. I'm, we have to reiterate that. General questions should be met with general answers. And we need to learn, and, and this is why half the battle of the league journey is learning to ask good quality questions. Absolutely. Specific, high quality questions. That's why we have our VOD question channel in our program, because we can see the very specific clip.
And then enough specific questions, then you can draw conclusions. Create principles. Yes. Put them together, see trends. So, But notice how this is the other way around, right? You can't go from general statement to a general uh, uh, principle. Yeah. It's the other way around. It's, it's the other way around. It's the specifics and then you create principles exactly from right. those. Exactly right. Many, 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 many specifics can then lead to very concise, beautiful uh, principles. And that's the only way to, to, to really go about it. Um, and now I'll say like last thing about this one. I'm going to use an anecdote, my, my, my gameplay. I had a game this week where I was playing Oriana into a Talia Pantheon mid jungle 2v2. It was a Pantheon mid with a Talia jungle. Level one, there was a, some very, very unfortunate series of events where I had to burn my flash. Now imagine being an Oriana into a Pantheon Talia with sums, with no cleanse. Unplayable. <laughs> it's unplayable. It's very, very, very hard, right? Yeah. So so I on the fly, I'm, I'm literally live comming this game in my Discord. I said, okay, well, I was planning on shoving, slow building, harassing, warding, leaning, doing the whole nine yards. Well, I can't ward anymore because I was late to lane, or late back to, I couldn't pressure the wave. I can't shove. So now what I have to do is I have to try and keep the wave on my side and be really close to my tower and try to live. Now, one might make an argument in that scenario where I should be really, really, really defensive. But I was trying to min-max my positioning. I wasn't sitting under the tower. I was trying to... Okay, can I... Can I? I'm trying to find that perfect sweet spot where I'm like, I'm, I'm still in range to farm a little bit and get a little bit of poke off on the pantheon and make him sweat a little bit, but also not being too, too aggressive such that I'll die. I'm trying to find that sweet spot. In the game, I was just a little bit too far up and then pantheon was able to get into flash W range. Talia goes in and I, and I die. Now, you know, you might, some people might say, well, p this guy might've said, well, why is this player not afraid to die here? Well, it's not that I was not afraid to die. I was aware that I was under threat, but I wanted to find the, the, the sweet spot, the absolute perfect point upon maximizing pressure and minima and being defensive. Walk in the tightrope. Walk in the tightrope. And that is is what you need to do if you want to be a high-level player in League of Legends. You need to find the sweet spot. Yeah. You can't go to the extreme of, oh, I'm just not going to die, and I sit under tower. And no, because there's other consequences. You're too that. easy to play against at too that e point. You're not, you're not overwhelming the mental stack. You're not going to exert any pressure. You're going to lose farm. There's, all, there's other consequences that I'm not willing to accept, right? And so realistically, um, a big reason is why oh, higher ELO plays limit test is because you need to find the limits. To get to the high levels in League, you've got to be on that tightrope all the time. Hmm. So that's really another thing as well. All right. Our third one here, Curtis, now. Again, from Summoner School here. This one was, it finally clicked. Elo Hell isn't real. So this is a play out pretty new to League. Obviously, if you're a, a long-time Broken by Concept listener, you probably know by now Elo Hell does not exist. I've played Norms intermittently since... 2013 but all in all i've probably only played a few hundred games i decided to pick it back up and was pretty bummed i got placed into iron one well i ended up tumbling all the way to iron four and was pretty pissed about being stuck in elo hell games i win i'll be 15 plus kills less than five deaths usually 20 or so assists great cs i get a lot i get a lot of s ranks in those games but then I had games where my team was just unbelievable. They'd abandon me in fights, get me killed, ignore pings, and just make horrible decisions, at least so I thought. I started checking my matches on Mobilytics and saw that every game I won, I was MVP or second in the lobby, but games I'd lose, I'd be down at 8th to 10th. I couldn't believe it. All those games that were my shitty teammates' faults, I was statistically the worst or one of in the lobby. I tried to figure out what was going on, and for me, I realized I was playing every game the same. If I was losing, I was still making decisions as if I had a huge snowballing lead on everyone, getting me killed over and over. So I started trying to think critically about the state of the game and how I should act differently. And after having about a 40% win rate in Iron for 80 games, I now just advanced to Silver with a 60 plus percent win rate. Granted, I'm still Silver, so like bottom 10% of players or whatever, but it was crazy to see how immediate the change was. I didn't improve mechanically, game knowledge or anything. I just realized every single loss, okay, 95% of losses were actually my fault and thinking about how to learn from them. 
I'm not sure who this post is for, maybe someone who feels like they're in Elo hell, but I mostly just wanted to share this because I have no one to talk to about League in real life. You can get out of Elo hell too. Just don't be so dumb like me. Curtis, this explanation here, by the way, uh, where was it here? Well, I ended up tumbling all the way. Oh, here we go. This one, this line right here. I tried to figure out what was going on and I realized I was playing every game the same. If I was losing, I was still making decisions as if I had a huge snowballing lead on everyone getting me killed over and over. This line, this is the iron player and the bronze player. Silver, I think it, people start to get that they shouldn't be doing as much. They don't need to do as much to win games. But that right there, I think, really sums up what iron games and iron players, their mindset or approach to the game. It's about kills. It's about uh, the scoreline. It's about like the, the you know the, your how well you're doing on your OPGG rank. And it's not looking at all the things else, the fundamentals, thing, champ mastery things that you could be focusing on. Yeah, no, I think you're right. Definitely, definitely spot on. You know, the way I interpret this is, is kind of, there's two, two elements. Number one, just the, just the actual power of curiosity. Just very, very basic, right? Something we always talk about. I don't want to riff on that too much, but you guys know the drill. Curiosity takes you a long way. You don't even need, you don't have to have a PhD in League of Legends. You don't need to understand a lot about the game, but just being, ba just very, very basic yeah. common sense curiosity why did I die here? Why was I pressuring here? Does this really, like at a, at a very basic level, will get you yeah. actually very far. So that's number one. Even though it might not be the best way to improve, at least he went and saw, oh, I'm doing really bad performance in terms of my stats. That is an Great. indication. Yeah. Great, I love that. I love that he's going out of his way to try and problem solve. Because I could see a lot of other Iron players that just ignore that yep. bit. They would just only focus on like, wow, like, uh, look at my, why am I not climbing? I'm just carrying all these games. The second layer is actually something that um, Alados, shout out Alados, he's an MLA coach, he uh, high low EU player. He said something fascinating to me, which was he said that he was struggling in, in games in Master Tier. And he said that for him, a mindset shift of just like raising, raising his own personal standards went a, a massively long way for him. And so... To riff on that, basically, because uh, I asked, like, what does that mean exactly? What do you mean by raising standards? He said, well, I was missing a lot of CS. And in the past, I would just kind of accept it as it is. I would kind of just look over it and be like, oh, yep, yep. Maybe looks the bigger things, whatever. There is a point in everyone's journey where you must raise your standards of yourself. Change won't happen unless you actually see things as a problem. It's very rare that you'll actually just kind of randomly improve at something if you don't really see it as a problem. And if you actually just attack it and be like, I'm not okay with this element of my play, whether I'm dying too much, I'm not CS, I'm missing a lot of CS, I'm missing a lot of skill shots. Just like being like, I'm not okay with that. Just raising your own personal standards goes a long way. And for him, that was a massive differentiating fact. It sounds basic, but you'd be surprised at how many oh, people were impacted massive. by this. And I think this one for him, that's why I interpret it. He's just basically turning around and basically said to himself, I'm not okay with how I'm playing from behind. I'm just raising my standards, my own personal standards of myself when I'm playing from behind. Let's see what happens when I do that. When I take this a little bit more seriously and I take myself a little bit more seriously, I play with a little bit more intention. And that got him from iron to silver in a pretty, with, a, with a pretty rid ridiculous win rate. And so I think there is an element of just like, um, personal standards. And it sounds very cheesy. It sounds very corny. It sounds a bit esoteric. Raise your standards. Raise your standards. But th there is an element of that. And I do believe that. And and um, and I actually do believe that in many aspects of life. So raising your standards of, of many areas. Um, is It's like a mindset shift that goes a long way. Um, so that's, that's the way I interpret this one. Yeah, I think that's great. I think that uh, definitely there was curiosity demonstrated here we raised our standards from how playing from behind i um with my i did a diamond review today uh diamond one and a really big one i'm on is punishing raptors it's really simple just taking the enemy raptors on spawn like so when you do raptors start 
they're really easy to get stolen if you're not back onto them on Spawn Wound because you need to be there by around 355, four minutes. And this Rengar player just completely missed it. And I was really hard on him for this. It's like, you've got, if you want to expect to be, you know, consistent master, you know, grandmaster, these things you need to raise your standards on. Uh, I should have used yeah. that terminology. I didn't yeah. use that terminology. There's a challenger player gets those Raptors every single time. Oh, that's, like, that, that's, but that's what I mean. It's standard. not necessarily that you can't do it. No. It's, it's that you got to see it as, as, as your standard. That is my standard. That is what I do on a day, on a game to game basis. And when you, Flick that switch and you that's the way you perceive yourself. It's It goes a, a very, very, very long way. I love that. I think that's a really great example. Hmm. And it's a small thing. It can be small things and small things add up. Yeah, like that's taking the one Raptors, that's not going to be the the game defining no. thing, but it's the approach. It's like, okay, if I get that little advantage here, I get that advantage here, like that advantage here, the whole game's going to start changing. Exactly same thing with ability usage. Like, it's like, I don't, it's like, yes. I, I raise my standards in, with my Syndra E usage. It's like, I'm not going to rush my Syndra E's. Now, that, again, that's not going to solve all of your problems, but it's going to go like, God, it's going to go a long way, a very long way. Um, little things like that, huge. Love that. All right, let's now move on, Curtis, to our school post of the week. This one came from Razga. The title of this email was, Am I too insecure to climb? Did I say title of this email? I don't even know what the hell you said. I don't want autopilot sometimes with mailbag. This title of this school post. I have a problem. I find myself making a bad play and instantly my mind goes straight to... Oh boy, I'm about to get flamed for losing the game now. What are they going to say? What should I say? Was it really my fault? Nah, surely it wasn't me. I made the right call. Or did I? Fuck, I don't know. Oh man, my support isn't going to trust me now. If I make another mistake, he'll spam ping me and leave the lane. That sort of thing. And suddenly all my focus gets pulled into this instead of the actual game. Even when I realize I'm doing it, I can't seem to stop. It's like when you're really tired and you can't help but close your eyes. I can't help but prepare, but prepare a full statement in my head defending my actions. I would say I'm generally a pretty confident person. I don't care too much what others think and more often... Then not, I don't bother with discussion if the subject seems pointless to me. But for some reason with league specifically, I start questioning myself super quickly and care way too much what four random people think of my gameplay. Like I have to prove my worth with every single game, despite the fact that I've been playing for nearly 13 years. The only way I've had the success in dealing with this issue so far has been to slash mute all but I'm getting to a rank where my mental stack is so overloaded that I'll often make very silly mistakes if I don't at least have my teammates pings enabled. And the worst part is that the fix seems so incredibly simple. Just stop caring so much about what your teammates think. They're the same rank as you. They're mis they, they make mistakes too. You should just focus and do your best to have a positive impact on the game. You'll never meet these people again. Why do you care what they think? But it's just so much easier said than done. If you made it all the way here, thank you for listening to my yapping. To be honest, I don't really know what sort of response I'm looking for here. I just realized how much this actually is affecting my games and my ranked journey overall and figured out others might be able to relate. I love that monologue at the start. That is a exactly what's going on in a lot of players' heads. You're not alone here, Razgar. Did you want to go through comments first or do you want to get our comments first? Because I think I did I did leave a, a, a response here. Yeah, so you, what you said was, uh, will people judge and flame you? Yes. Will you lose people the game? Yes. Will you look like the worst player in a given game at times? Yes. Welcome to League of Legends. <laughs> we all experience this at times and it always feels like we are the person griefing a game because we are the ones experiencing the problems. Everyone feels like a fraud throughout their journey because we are painfully aware of our own inadequacies. If you spent the time looking at any other player on your team, you'd see the same mistakes, hence why you're all the same rank. It's because you are only viewing the game through your lens that you are aware of the mistakes. You can only ever play to your level. Never be ashamed of what that level is. Our goal is to not win every game, nor to look good, nor to carry. Our goal every time we queue up is to express our best self, whatever the level of play may be. That's the only true thing in our control. Never forget that. So the reason I, I framed it like that is because again, it's all it's all perspective. 
everyone, and we, we've seen this, Nathan, with with clients where you know you, you, they bring a vod, right? And one of the main reasons people don't looking like looking at their vods and their own gameplay is because they always look worse than they thought. Everyone's gameplay in hindsight looks way worse than you thought. You're like, is that me? Yeah. Holy shit, I look like crap here. Yeah. Why, why am I moving like a minion here? Oh my goodness. Even even my own. Even I'm my sure. own yeah, to this gameplay. day. Like everyone thinks that they look uh, look like a superstar and this play that they did was really fancy and really cool and they they And then and they my look review, at it and like, oh. Or in my review, I'll be like, wow, I just got lucky there or I was a bit <laughs> slow or my FK or my ability usage was slow there. And, and even just, let's just take the, the, the play objectively you know, look at like the actual effectiveness of the decision making and just look at it aesthetically, right? It just, a lot of the time, you know, even to this day, my 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 plays look like look like shit. Like comparatively, look at Trovi, I'm like, okay, that looks like beautiful League of Legends. Look at mine, I'm like, oh my goodness. That looks like a bloody car crash, you know? That's not, that's, that's ugly, right? And so I think that everyone's gameplay looks ugly, but we are just painfully aware of it when you look at it. And I think that the more self-aware you are and the more you know about the game, like I'm assuming here he, he's actually quite intentional about his journey. Mm -hmm. You seem like a quite a self-aware individual and you, you know, you're really aware of your, your own internal dialogue, which is great. I think the more, and you've, you've been a massive advocate of this, Nathan, where like kind of we talk about the, the smarter the individual, and that's a, again, a loaded term, but let's say the more self-aware the individual is, um, the, the, the harder the, the journey will be. It's, and, uh, they're more in their head. They're more in their head. And, and, and one of the reasons for that is because they're painfully aware of, of the mistakes that they are making and all of the inadequacies and all of the errors that they're, they're making in their gameplay. And that even gets worse when you look at the gameplay in the review. And so I think that it's important to remember that if you were to look at anyone else's gameplay, they all look like shit. You look at your, your jungler, your mid laner, your top laner, your AD carry, they, they all look like crap. And so um, there is no moment in your journey where you're like, yes, wow, I look amazing. I look like Faker. That's just not going to happen to 99.99% of players. And even someone like Faker, you know, he's yeah. had his journey. He's been flamed. He's been caught. He's, he's looked like the worst player in the game. Everyone has gone to, there's not just this end game where mm. I just, I'm just born. I start playing League of Legends. I just play perfectly every single game. And the people that critique you, by the way, they're, they're just less self-aware than you. That's the thing. So, so toxicity, right? One of the main, one of the main culprits uh, or offenders of toxicity are the people that lack self awareness. So, I'll give you uh, this extrapolates again into life, and I love you know dragging things back into life. But you take people that are the the um, the worst drivers, right? The most aggressive drivers, or the the people that beep you on the road and and swear at you and all this crap. They are the least self-aware individuals and least self-aware drivers. They they have no idea how aggressive they are, how bad drivers they are. But 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 again, everyone else can see objectively that they're not good drivers. But in their mind, they're the best and they're, they're driving amazingly and they're just abusing everyone else. They're, they're not self-aware at all. The, the less self-aware these individuals are, the more toxic they are going to be to other people around them because they just don't have the perspective. You know, when it comes to um, general... I would say one of the, at least for me, and this is going to be, I would say very, just, just my take, right? This is not some scientific objective thing, just me. A sign of intelligence is, one of the biggest signs of intelligence is, is self-awareness and the awareness of how they are affecting others around them. And, and, um, and I think in solo queue, there's a lot of people that they think they're, they're on this high horse. And that's the worst combination where they feel like they are the, the smart, intelligent, superior person. And then they belittle everyone around them. Is that Dunning Kruger? It's Dunning Kruger effect. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. Where they feel like they're the ones that they, they don't even they're not even aware of how wrong they are, and they they're sitting on this high horse thinking, "I'm making all the right plays. You guys are all making all the wrong plays. I'm up here. You're down here." And that you just creates this very kind of toxic environment. Now you're in this position where it seems like you're you're kind of quite self-aware, so you're very critical of your own gameplay, and you're hyper aware of maybe these other people's criticisms. But the people that you're getting criticized by, they're not objectively looking at your gameplay. They don't have your best interests in heart. They they're not even they don't they don't even understand the game, right? So you, you you know, it's not as much don't listen to them. It's more listen to them, but you realize how it's like listening to a ten year old say that you know trying to explain something that they have no idea about. It's just like yeah, listen to them. But it shouldn't mean anything to you because it's coming from someone that is is not 
in a position to really criticize you. You know what I mean? Like, I think that's the better way to frame it. Like when someone criticizes me on my YouTube videos or says something about me, about I don't know anything or blah, 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 blah. It's like, I will hear that, but it doesn't really mean anything to me because I know that it's coming from someone that is delusional or someone that doesn't have my best interests at heart. They haven't critically analyzed why I don't know what I'm talking about. It's not like they've broken it down and dissected it and be like, this is wrong because of blah, 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 blah. Here's all the evidence to do this. And if someone was actually giving me valid criticism, then it's fine. I'm going to hear them out. We can actually have a com proper conversation. You, you actually hear, you, if you actually would add these people after the game and ask them specifically what they're criticizing, they wouldn't even be able to tell you. They'd be like, oh, uh, uh, yeah, they, they would stumble over their words. They wouldn't even be able to say it because they don't understand it. So you, when you understand that it's all an illusion, that all this critique that is coming from people is coming from people that don't necessarily even know what they're talking about, it just flies over your head. Mm. I think that's a huge, a huge one. Really, really, really big one. <clears throat> I think so. I would take comfort in your intention. Are you still, are you trying your best? Are you trying to improve? That's all you can ask for, you mm. know? Like if you're after the game, you know, this is this whole monologue at the beginning of all these questions, all these critical things, and you're really afraid of people, what they're going to say about you. As long as I play my best at my skill level, whatever that is, and I'm really trying to improve, I'm trying hard, I'm happy. That's it. That's all you can ask for. You're absolutely your, your intention is that. so important. If you're playing with intention and you're making decisions with intention and you're queuing up with intention. And if I ruin the game from fuck my, everyone else. Yeah. And if I ruin the game from that, I'm, I'm learning. I'm, I'm, I'm having, you know, I've ruined so many games. Yep. It's unbelievable. And you will, you will continue to. Yes. It doesn't and stop. And you have to. You have to. And you have to because you, you have to, in a way, be selfish because it's your learning journey. Yes. You have to make decisions that are going to help your learning in the long run. And yes, will that piss off a few other people and, and potentially lose the game for four other people? Yes. But you know what? They're going to do, they should, they're going to do the same to you. Yep. In the next game of the game, it's, it's, it, that's it, just the way the game works. You got to be, you got to fail with conviction, play with conviction, fail boldly. And that's what will get you to, you know, and, and again, seek comfort in what Nathan said, seek comfort in your intention. That's the, that is, I, I love that. That's a really, really great way of articulating it. Um, and yeah, I think that's the main things really. I don't have any more to add. Uh, I think practically for, especially these people that really struggle with criticism from their teammates, mute all, mm. you know, there's, you know, and then you can undo pings, but mute all it just works like a charm. You know, as well though, Nathan, I, I, I kind of think as well, there is an element of like, um, confidence coming from knowing that the process works. Yes. You know what I mean? It's like, so, so, so it's like this person cues up, right? Let's say this person is struggling, but it's like train yourself to be like, all right, I, 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 maybe I'm struggling to deal with this. Maybe I'm, I'm overly sensitive. Okay, cool. But Let's just fake it till I make it. And then when you start to see a bit of result and you know that the process is working, then you'll have confidence knowing that you're doing the right thing and that then you're just on the right you track. You can always lean back on that you again. Can just lean once back again, on that. Yeah, exactly. take comfort in the process. This is just part exactly of it. Right. And this has worked for me before. So exactly. I, I, it might not look like it's working right now, but I trust the process. Exactly right. All right, mailbag time, Curtis. Yep. Away we go. song all righty then the first question here comes from joshin joshin i'm not sure how to pronounce that one uh source god or saucen he's also known by oh pronounce yorkin 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 stage four issues and ranked journey hello coach and nathan i started playing league in december of last year and joined the mid lane academy Midland Academy shortly after turning level 30. Beginning of this split, I started in Iron 2 and I'm currently sitting in Silver 4 playing mostly Malzahar right now. That is just great. I'm so excited for this. Level 30 joins MLA using the Malzahar Champ Guide. This is a good case study, Curtis. I'm excited for this one. It's already, he's already on the great track. I've previously cycled through Vex, Annie, Syndra, Asol, Ari, and a brief time in Tin as a Mumu jungle main. Oh my god, and he's played lots of other things as well. This is getting better and better. 
I've always followed the three block process and review each game after the game ends. Okay, this can't be real. This is ridiculous. <laughs> I believe this has led to my small bit of success during my short time playing this game. For a while, I was blindly reviewing without much focus on learning objectives, but mostly reviewing my deaths and built threat assessment by looking at the fights through the other player's perspective. I'm done, Curtis. Solved. Next email. Yep. I don't care what question you have. <laughs> Keep doing what you're doing, Jochen. You're <laughs> rocking and rolling. Recently, I've been wanting to really dive in and learn the game, hence why my switch to Melzar. Recently, I've been good about focusing on just a few learning objectives and getting reviews in also while posting in the VOD channel, VOD questions channel in the MLA Discord. <laughs> Shout out to the MLA mentors. So he's following the process. He's using he's utilizing every feature of the Midland Academy. He's playing the approved champions. I mean, the recommended champions. I'm speechless. I say all that to say this. Recently, I've recognized that I have been dealing with stage four issues and still queuing up for ranked. I have a stressful job as a high school and college music teacher and come from work later in the week exhausted. I find great joy in playing league and improving myself on the rift, but I'm afraid that stage four issues are prohibiting me from making consistent progress and truly expressing my best self on the rift. I can tell while I warm up with lol dodge game how I'm going to perform in that block. I can feel the inconsistency in my plane. As some games, the game just makes sense and things click so easily. And somewhere I recognize the general tie tiredness. It feels like I don't have, don't even recognize the game that I'm playing. That I'm so tired. It's very evident looking at my ranked games on my OPGG. Sorry for the long-winded background. But, uh, but my question is this. If you know you are dealing with stage four issues, should you still queue up? How do you balance dealing with those issues and still getting the reps in? Should I only queue up when I'm feeling stress-free and well-rested? What advice would you have for someone in my situation? Being a part of the Midland Academy has truly changed my life. I use many MLA concepts in my own teachings and with my own students. Y'all's approach to improvement, learning, and dealing with outside life issues is continuously inspiring, and I can't thank you enough for the community the two of you have built. Wow. It's amazing. Your what an email. Fantastic. I genuinely am still gobsmacked at the way he's learned the game and you utilize the program. Incredible. Uh, so, stage four issues. Okay, so specifically his stage four issues are coming home, um, really tired. kind of yeah. tired, exhausted, stressed out a bit, um, and that's impacting his gameplay. Yeah. That's that's on the more good side of yeah. stage four issues, by the way. They're kind of the positive stage you know? four issues. They could be a <laughs> yeah. lot worse. There's a lot worse, you know, you know, blaming teammates, not taking responsibility, view, weird views of the game. So that's good. The good news is, is that this is a you know, a stage four issue that's very I mean, again, I wouldn't say manageable, but like... There's things we can do. Yeah. Okay, so the way I, I think of this is that there's very kind of, kind of I guess, pragmatic, actionable things we can do in the here and now to, I guess, uh, lower stress and anxiety um, and, and sleepiness so that you can f perform better on the Rift. So, you know, I would look at things like... Um, how is it... Okay, so what is the cause of your stress? Literally start tackling it. Like, okay, rather than accepting your stress, stress is a sign that something is not right, right? Something is not going right in, in, in your kind of day-to-day. -day. There's something off. Now, um, the reason I, I really talk about it like this is because this is something that I've dealt with. I've, I, I, I get overwhelmed. I get anxious. I get stressed. We all do. But rather than just like living with that, you got to try and tackle it like a problem in league. It's like, I've got a problem with my warning and leaning rather than doing that mistake every single day and living with that and try to win games while dying to ganks. It's like, okay, why don't we just try and solve this problem first? What, what can I do to lower this stress and anxiety? Okay, well, can I better prepare my, my, my days? It, what are the things that are in my control that I can actively lower stress in these particular uh, scenarios? Are there any techniques where I can... Um, you know, for example, meditations, working out, um, going to bed earlier, journaling. I'm going to use a, maybe a specific example about, you know, being a teacher just from experience. I know I have some teacher uncles and aunties and that sort of stuff. They, uh, you know, like marking people's work and, you know, stuff like that. They go through some periods and sometimes they say they just try and get it done in 
school hours or whatever, or like they maybe stay after school for a little bit. I don't know how it works right. in America. Just so they, you know, sort of unload in the, the mental stack type things of what I have to do. Yeah, I, don't, right. I, don't, I don't know what it's like for a music Yeah, and this is just, again, these, you need to... But rather, just the, the, it's the approach. It's just the approach. Yeah, it's just like, dr- be intentional rather than living with this. It's because it's, for me, the way I'm viewing this email is like, I've got these issues. How do I work while having them? But the question should be, okay, sure, that that is a good question. But also the other question I would ask is, what could I do to lower or manage this these problems in the first place like prevention prevention exactly so like yes these are stage four issues but rather than living with these stage four issues what can we do to better deal with them so that would be the first question again like i said nathan said whether it's separating your work and and play where it's like you don't do any school work on your pc at home and you try to find a, a separate environment or you do it all at school whether it's like i said uh uh, journaling and meditation and exercise and more sleep and this and that. There's things you can do in your lifestyle to lower stress and anxiety. I would exhaust all of those options first. That would be priority number one. Not because it's going to make you perform better on the rift because you're going to have a better quality of life. It's not even necessarily about performing better on the rift. That's a bonus, right? You should be doing this anyway, right? So that's number one. Then number two, it's like, okay, well, energy levels, you also have things like caffeine and and, and the when you're eating, are you eating very um, carb-dense meals in the middle of the day? You know, intermittent fasting, there's many things you could do to increase energy levels, again, if you put the time and effort. And then number three, okay, given all these circumstances, um, you know, should you play league? Well, this is where you've got to be in tune with your body and in tune with your mind. You know, some days is where I recommend a more dynamic approach. Some days you're going to have a shit fucking day at work. You're going to be exhausted. Maybe play, maybe don't play. Maybe literally take the day off that day. The other days where you're feeling, okay, I've got a bit of energy, do a three block. The days where you're feeling like you can play, but not a lot, do a two block. You need to be dynamic with your approach and the way you you kind of implement, um, uh, you know, hobbies. I do this with gym, right? So specifically with me, with gym, days where I'm feeling super high energy, I'll go hard as I possibly can. If I'm feeling strong on a day, I will push that. my body to the extreme. And then other days I'm like, I'm feeling really low energy. I'll just rock up, do the bare minimum and get the hell out of there. Some days, if I know, I, I literally had this lot the other week where I didn't sleep well. I had like five hours sleep and I literally didn't go. And I'd very rarely do that, but I, I knew if I went, I would feel miserable. I would get a shit workout. I would probably injure myself. I'm not even going to bother. It is what it is. That's an outlier, but they happen. And so I think like having a dynamic approach and being aware of your body and how you feel and being honest with yourself is such an important part of this. Hmm. Um, Not just with league, but with every aspect. And again, college and school, high school, these, there's like on and off times, right? So maybe if you've exhausted absolutely everything, there's going to be periods where you can go, maybe your league journey looks different to a lot of people. It's like, I burst on the school holidays. It's or, like the the miner, the guy who works in the mines, Yes, right? the week, he, the seven days on, seven yeah, days seven off. Days on, he, he goes hard for seven days and seven days off. Like you, sometimes you've got to do what you got to do. You might have periods of your, your year, like Nathan was saying, where it's exam time or you're marking a lot of shit and you got to, you just don't, you just can't play that much. Nope. And then you have these three months where you can grind your ass off and make a lot of progress. Maybe that's just the way your journey looks like. How can I be the best ranked player given my circumstances? It's a great question. I love that. High quality questions. So I hope that gives you a little bit to think about. But absolutely on the right track. I yes. would not be concerned about this person. How many reviews have you done? How, many, how long has York and been in the program? I don't recall, but he said like till last year. I think he said, that's what he said. Started playing league in December. Oh yeah, and joined yeah, MLA shortly after. All right, next one here comes from Adam. The title of this email is Camera Control is Driving Me Utterly Insane. We haven't heard this one before in the mailbag, Curtis. Greetings from Spain. I wanted to reach out about a concept that I can't find that much information about online that has become my obsession and bane of my existence when playing League for two to three years now Camera Control. As per your latest podcast, there is no doubt it completely destroys and overwhelms my mental stack during important trades in the laning phase and team fighting that distracts me from more important things to keep track of. It all started when I started watching the 2K LP Chinese super top Zhao Chao Meng. Mm. Zhao Chao Meng. Yeah. Uh, To improve my bruiser bruiser, uh, champ pool. And I noticed that this camera that his camera remains locked to the majority of his gameplay. Before this, I never thought about the camera much, but this is when my fixation kicked in. 
In time, I noticed many other strong top laners play with locked cam. Serdi, Potent, Rice, Riker, Adam. As a mainly free cam player who struggled with moving my character smoothly, I believe this was the answer to my struggles when it came to the aspects of my mechanics. But I quickly felt uncomfortable with how little information I could see at a time, even in my own lane, and especially in team fights later in the game. Granted, most of these players unlock occasionally when team fighting, but I struggled to ever find a spot where locking my camera didn't limit my information and that discomfort never allows me to enjoy the pros of an easier time moving my character precisely. I never see high ELO players talk about this much beyond free cam is better in the long term, but even Surti says this and he plays locked. Is there a right answer? Neither option feels comfortable for me right now, even mix, and I feel so desperately helpless as this is such an essential and constant part of the game. Even some sage advice on how to break this fixation would be a go a long way for me. Thanks very much, Adam. And he's stuck in limbo, D2 to a very low master. <clears throat> okay. So camera control as a laner. Yeah, as a jungler, this is very different. Uh, I'll just start with that. Uh, FK usage is obviously really important for a jungler because you want to identify the quickest, most efficient way what's going on in all three lanes and quickly assessing wave states. I couldn't really ever say locked camera is good for a jungler. But it sounds... I actually didn't know that some... Is this common? Like, It just doesn't matter. It just doesn't it, matter? It, when, when we're in lane, it just simply doesn't matter. Because you're focusing on the... Because you're not and... really moving your camera all that much. Yeah. Right? So so the way I frame it, right? What What is... what? what when we're controlling our, ca- our camera, right? We're trying to um, essentially pick where what information we are gathering. Okay. Now, in the lane phase, for the majority of the lane phase, you're only focused on this small area on your screen, right? You're trading with this one person. And the wave. And the wave, right? You don't need to, you don't really need to move your camera all that much. Maybe as a mid laner, though, you might need to move your camera to your jungler if there's a skirmish or something like that. And a lot of great players, what you'll see is that they unlock their camera in skirmishes. Mm -hmm. Right, the minimap probably does a lot of, of work for you. Minimap though, right? does the majority. Yeah, the mor- of minimap does a lot for so, a so, so my point being is whether it is locked in the lane or whether it isn't, it, it has no bearing on it's 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 whatever. It doesn't matter. It's whatever is comfortable for you. Right? That is literally what so so to to calm your nerves and to calm your anxiety, it doesn't matter. Yeah, like trying to find the optimal way. Like there's there's so many places. It's like that- DPI. It doesn't matter. Yeah. DPI is it, it, okay. As long as it gets the job done. It, it doesn't matter. And it and, and now this, there might be some very hypothetical, you know, theoretical reasons why having a lower DPI rather than a super high DPI or having a free cam rather than lock cam, there might be some crazy reasons. It is a beyond a 0.01%. As long as you were ticking the major 20%ers of being able to move your camera when you're moving to plays and being able to move your camera in fights. As long as you have free cam in fights and you know how to alter between lock camera and free cam in fights, that's all that matters. Now, there are two, to, now to simplify it, or to, I guess, not simplify it, to, to clarify for you, in team fights, there are two ways to, to control your character. Option number one is to have free cam permanently and you just recenter your character by tapping the space bar. That's option number one. That's what I do. Free cam 24-7 throughout the entire game. I never lock my camera. And if I if I lose control of my character, I press the space bar, boom, I've reset my character. That's option number one. Option number two is that you approach the majority of the game in locked cam and then you manually override it um, and unlock your camera situationally when you need to gather more information. So maybe you're moving to a team fight and you need to move your camera or maybe the fight is moving in a particular direction and you need to unlock your camera. And some people find that more enjoyable. A lot of top laners do this as well specifically because, um, yeah, they're just, they don't really, they're not really moving all over the place. Like majors and a lot of mid laners do need to be very cerebral about the way the fight is happening holistically. Whereas a lot of top laners just need to fight whatever in front of their face. They don't need to, they don't need to be considering the entirety of the fight in, in general. So that's why a lot of top laners bruises typically just have a lot of camera a lot of the time and just manually override. So they're the two kind of, I guess, categories of camera control. 
Now, which one you do doesn't matter. It's whatever feels more comfortable to you. Um, uh, and that's it. It's end of story. That's all you need to know. Mm. It's really that simple. And and, okay. and and I would say the 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 other the only other like twenty percent is that you need to be able to have the 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 key binds to like the Nathan said before the F keys. It doesn't necessarily have to be on the F keys. Whatever the key binds are for you to other teammates. That I think is a pretty big twenty percent as well. Yeah. Okay. That's it. I didn't really think that's it. Yeah, I think it makes I've, sense. I've seen players that are super high challenger with lock cam. I've seen, I mean, I am a high challenger player with free cam. I've seen many other free cam players. It, you've seen people use quick cast with indicator, no indicator. It doesn't matter. There's so many different setups. Clamp, clamping, your camera, clamping your camera, non-clamping your camera, smooth camera, non-smooth camera, 12K DPI, <laughs> like we saw before, 2K DPI. We've seen Schoenfire with like 50 DPI <laughs> and, and other players with 3K DPI. It doesn't matter. Uh, Stop overthinking it. Yeah. It's really that simple. That should help his fixation. Yeah, yes. It doesn't matter. Play what's comfortable. As long as it's not preventing you from like... Gathering information. Gathering information, like misplaying fights. Yes. It's fine. Pick one and go down that route. Yeah, you know it's so it's so fancy and sexy to go on YouTube, see the best player in the world, two K L P Chinese, and be like, I got to do that. Yeah, it's not realistic, and 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 as well, like some people have just built this muscle memory over years. That, but you like, look at Faker and you look at Showmaker, like look at the way they manage their camera. It's completely different. Yeah, it is, isn't it? Faker looks like a god, and you look at Trovio at Showmaker. Their camera paintings and their camera controls, like yeah, just Nothing whatever. Special. It looks very normal. Yeah. You wouldn't think you wouldn't you would look if you put that camera control on an average platinum player you're like oh cool this looks normal mm. camera control is not what differentiates these players just put it out there you can look at their pov it's all on youtube but fake up makes it look extreme you don't need that though obviously there's like that meme of fake have you seen that that way playing edits? the multiple games yeah all yeah, the yeah. games and stuff so okay. like, all right uh next question here comes from kit the title of this email is Help, I'm Scrambled. Scrambled. Scrambled eggs. All right. Hey, Nathan and Curtis. Context. I found myself in a particularly difficult situation. Lately, it's felt like I, a switch has flipped, leaving my mental much more vulnerable than it has before. My history of playing competitive games for money built a healthy growth-focused mindset towards games, and this has been my consistent strength despite the game I play. I recently decided that I would start focusing on properly learning League. A month into learning, I began to hard stomp in ranked playing while playing a pool of Set, Mundo, and Darius in the top lane. The issue is one of consistency. Situation. I don't know what changed, but lately I've been becoming frustrated with the game in a way I hadn't found myself in two years of playing LOL and at seemingly nothing to make it worse. I found myself fighting off unhealthy solo queue narratives and the space in my mental stack this takes in game has led me to being an unstable player. I'm struggling to continue shaking off the games that are out of my hands and having an even harder time maintaining the hope I need to be able to win the games where I can be in control. TLDR, I enjoy the game even when losing, but I've recently felt frustration instead of my usual motivation when winning means bearing the full responsibility of solo carrying and out playing. What steps do you think I can take to rebuilding my fortitude in game? And do you think this might be a result of me losing my love for the game? Thank you for your time and the amazing podcast you grace us with. BBC has been a huge part in my learning as a player, and I look forward to some guidance. Very quickly, two things off the top of my head. Number one, you need to get inspired. One of the things, whenever you feel like you're starting to lose the plot and you start to feel like you're focusing things out of your control and get beat down by the game, nothing beats watching some of the best players in the world. Load up the best Darius. Load up the best uh, uh, set players. Load up, watching, watch their VODs. Watch their lanes. How are they doing? Like, and and what that does, it just it puts things in perspective. It's like, holy shit, this guy is playing at like a challenger level, grandmaster level. He's doing these things. I'm playing in this rank. Surely, there's a lot I'm doing wrong, and you will see it. You will see those details. And and then it's not because it's the reason I'm so passionate about this is that it, it really, it really um allows you to be like, holy shit, there's all these things I could be doing differently in my games. And it makes you realize how much is actually in your control. Now you may not be able to execute that, but it's like, it's like the possibility. It's like, 
if this person were in my games, they would be killing it and they would be stomping. Like the fact that that is a thing, the fact that Chovy could play on my account and get rank one is like, wow, there is just so much I'm leaving on the table. And it's just so cool looking at like people who have insane champ mastery and showing you what's like, what's capable what they what, what the game what you can do with that particular champion and so that's that's a huge one that I still still do to this day that I highly recommend. Number two, you need to get back into the details. What, what, so typically, when people start to lose or they become more, I guess, uh, vulnerable mentally, it's because they're losing track of what they need to improve upon. They they've actually lost mm -hmm. like their plateau. They don't know what they don't know. And so when you don't know the things that you're missing and you don't know what you need to do to climb and win these games, the game becomes inherently frustrating because think about it. The way your mind is always going to work is um, it's, it's going to gravitate towards uh, what's going to make me win this game. And if you can't answer that question in terms of what you can control, it's going to fill that spot with Oh yeah, but didn't you see your bot lane just go zero eight? Didn't you see your jungler not come top? Didn't you see your your jungler blah blah blah? It's gonna fill it will fill in that gap. Why did you lose that game with whatever external that is out of your control? So you need to if you can't fill that hole immediately with what you can control and things that you know you need to actively do, like your key mistakes, hmm. it's gonna get out of control very quickly. So you're saying switch the the question from what could I have done to win this game to how do I trade better at this getting to the details? Yeah, specific, getting the how details. do I trade here? Yeah, how do I use and my if you ult can't here? answer how that question, if you can't answer those questions, that is the problem. That is why you're at, that's why you're um, mentally compromised. That means you need to do more study, you need to either get coaching, you need to you know, whatever it is you need to do to get more knowledge about the game and figure out what's going wrong. Yeah. I want to bring it to his top champ pool. Now, I played a lot of Darius. You played a lot of Set. Yep. He did talk about Mundo. I'm just going to talk about Darius and Set. Like, these champions are really unforgiving. Very, and very they can, unforgiving. And I could, I could see players that play these champs that just have miserable experience in their games because it's just... They, they can be great in their hands, right hands, but they're... Like people, uh, a lot of people set, you, we put out the short on the set. People were saying set's like the easiest champ in the game. They were really angry that you were saying how, easy, how hard set was and like, oh, you must be bronze. These champs, there's so many levels of skills to these champs. It's like insane. Uh, team fights, knowing what fights to go to and not go to. Because if you go to a really bad fighter set and Darius, you are going to be like the worst champ in the game. Like there's not a worse champ. That well, can look this at is fights. the thing, it's all levels. Like yeah, playing set in uh, in in silver is not difficult because no one knows how to tether. Mm. The, the, the people like the, the set set is the ultimate like noob stomper. That's what set is. It's the ultimate. It's it, 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 in the lower elo brackets. The kit is amazing, absolutely amazing because you're gonna always get in that E. People are gonna underestimate your Q movement speed. They're not gonna. They're gonna disrespect your W damage. You know, it's just it's just a kit that just stomps. Um, it punishes poor fundamentals and it stomps poor micro. That's what it does. But when people know how to tether, and you're versing a competent Aatrox, good luck. That's mm. all I'm gonna say. Mm. Good luck. Mm. Right? Yeah, Aatrox. Yeah, you win. You'll win that levels one to six, <clears throat> and you can you can get a big lead. But roll around level seven, level eight, level nine. You tell me that champion is easy. Yeah. Show me your gameplay. That's Show me you playing at a decent rank. Curtis's response to all the TikTok comments. There, yeah, I, mean, I just can't. My just brain rot right there. I just can't even <laughs> respond to that. Uh, so yeah, I think that could be the champions as well that he's picking. Yes, and the way he's playing them can be very unfun. These champions can be a blast if you get into the details. And you might want to champ all cycle. Mm. Maybe you're interested and, and play a champ that is a different style. Maybe maybe invest in a champion that's a little bit more methodical, like a Gwen. Or something like that, you know. There are champions more that are scaling more scaling and more structured, yeah, and like have clear, like, like, like. Um, I think you know, Camille, Gwen, these sorts of champions can give you some clear reference points and and be be a little bit uh, more forgiving. Not more forgiving, but like, yeah, I guess more forgiving actually. Yeah, they yeah, are. just more forgiving. Yeah. Um. So that could also be something that interests you. Just get a different perspective over the game. Great. I like it. All right, great questions today. Very good questions. Good uh, Reddit posts. We'll have all those linked in the description below. That's it for our episode today, guys. Good work. Keep on improving. Process three blocks. We'll see you guys next week.